Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering hyperkalemia. Now, I've, I've, I've already covered hypokalemia, I've done hypernatremia, hyponatremia. You don't have to necessarily watch it in any order, but it would make sense to keep your hypers and your hypos together. Don't just mix around, but you can watch it in any order, but I strongly encourage you to watch the entire series. I'm not done with the series yet, but I will do a, an, an entire series on the fluids and electrolytes, and I encourage you to watch the entire series. Before I get started, guys, please don't forget to like this video, subscribe to this channel if you haven't done so already, and engage with me in the comment section. It really helps my algorithm. Let me know what you thought about this video. And something I noticed that you guys really don't do much, which if I were a nursing student, I would do talk to each other in the comment section. If you're struggling with something and you're looking for a particular resource that you can't get your hands on, ask for it. Maybe somebody with a good heart will send it to you. Like you guys have a whole network. I think I have about I'm thinking 80,000 uh followers now, I'm not sure, but whatever number it is, use each other as resources. Some people are very nice, very kind, very unselfish. And if you say you're looking for something and you give your email address or maybe a Dropbox, maybe somebody will share it with you. I actually was thinking about creating a Dropbox where you guys can just share stuff amongst each other, but I'm not trying to get in trouble. So I decided against it, but there's nothing against you doing it for yourself. If you're struggling with something or you want a particular resource that you cannot get your hands on, you may be in Florida, you can't get your hands on it, but maybe somebody in Hawaii can, maybe somebody in Australia can, you never know. I'm just saying something to think about. Anyway, don't forget, I have audio lessons available for you on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. And you guys can catch me covering different types of questions almost daily on my other social media platforms, such as Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram. So guys, with that being said, let's get started. Hyperkalemia. Now, I always like to put the range just to remind you, the normal therapeutic range for potassium is 3.5 to 5. Very narrow therapeutic range, 3.5 to 5. And anything outside of that therapeutic range, we have problems, specifically cardiac problems. But you know, there are lots of other problems as well. So just make sure that you understand your therapeutic range is 3.5 to 5. Anything less than 3.5, you're hypokalemic. Anything higher than five, you're hyperkalemic. So let's look at what it says. It says hyperkalemia is an electrolyte imbalance in which the serum potassium level is higher than five. Look at this, guys. Even small increases above the normal values can cause excitable tissues, especially what? The heart. When it comes to potassium, that's going to be your biggest concern. That's what you need to be thinking about, the heart. The heart is very sensitive to serum potassium increases, leading to heart block and VFib, ventricular fibrillation. Sudden potassium rises cause severe problems at serum levels between six and seven. But when it rises slowly, problems cannot occur until the potassium level reaches eight or higher. So the um, speed at which that level increases also makes a big difference. Hyperkalemia is rare in people with normal kidney function. Why is that? Because patient with normal kidney function, they urinate normally and the potassium comes out of the urine normally, right? If the kidney is working properly, it will reabsorb the correct amount of potassium need, needed. We really get into problems when that, that kidney is not working the way that it's supposed to be working. Those at greatest risk are those that are chronically ill, those that are debilitated, which means they're not moving around, and older patients. And it makes sense because with those older patients, the kidney function is going to um, decline just because we're in tear of the body, right? Let's take a look at assessment. Let me look this up for you. You're going to ask the patient about kidney disease because of the reason I just explained. You're going to ask them about diabetes, recent medical or surgical treatment, and urine output, and even the amount of voidings. And I put an arrow down here. All of these things you're asking about, you're asking them to try to lead you to an idea of the potential reason for hyperkalemia. And we'll go over this list in a little bit, but this list are reasons that the patient may possibly be hyperkalemic. So that's why you're asking about it. Cardio, oh, I skipped something. Let's go up here. You're going to ask 
uh, whether the patient has palpitations, skip heartbeats, other cardiac irregularities, muscle twitching, leg weakness, unusual tingling or numbness around the face or feet. That's what's known as paresthesia. You're going to ask about changes in bowel habits, especially diarrhea. Why? This whole paragraph, everything here that I just mentioned are signs and symptoms of hyperkalemia. You're going to ask the patient about medications possibly being taken. Ask them about potassium sparing diuretics. That S in sparing, such as spironolactone, makes you hold on to potassium, and that can cause the patient to be hyperkalemic. So you're going to ask them about a potassium sparing diuretics, such as spironolactone. You're going to ask them about ACE inhibitors that can increase the potassium. You're going to ask them about the use of salt substitutes. Patients who are hypertensive and they've been told to stay away from salt, but they like their food seasoned. They like their food with that salty taste. They may use salt substitutes, not realizing that salt, salt substitutes are high in potassium. It's got hidden potassium in it. So you're going to ask the patient about those. Okay. Cardiovascular changes are the most severe form um, problems of hyperkalemia and are the most common cause of death in patients with hyperkalemia. And that's why when it comes to hyperkalemia, we're going to be thinking about the heart. We're going to be concerned about these heart issues. Let's talk about the heart issues. Bradycardia, that low heart rate. Remember, your heart rate is supposed to be 60 to 100. It's not, not supposed to drop lower than 60. Hypotension, low blood pressure, ECG changes. What would we see on the ECG? Tall peak T waves, prolonged PR, PR intervals, flat or absent P waves, and wide QRS complexes. Professor D, do I have to memorize this? Do I have to know this? Absolutely. You're going to see this again. Complete heart block, asystole, and V-fib are life-threatening complications of severe hyperkalemia. I don't know why I didn't have that highlighted in a different color, but you need to know that. The complete heart block, asystole, and ventricular fibrillation. Those are life-threatening complications of hyperkalemia. And you see hyperkalemia has lots of complications, but this will kill you faster. Let's talk about the neuromuscular changes. In the early stages of hyperkalemia, we'll see muscle twitching. We'll see muscle irritation right? We'll see tingling and burning sensations followed by numbness in the hands and feet and around the mouth. It's through paresthesia. But as, as the hyperkalemia gets worse, we go from muscle irritation and muscle twitching to muscle weakness, right? We now see flaccid paralysis. It's so weak that those muscles are basically paralyzed. We see flaccid paralysis, and look at the big difference. This is a big difference between hypo and hyperkalemia. In hyperkalemia, the respiratory muscles aren't affected until the serum potassium level reaches lethal levels. Look at this. Respiratory muscles are not affected until serum potassium levels reach lethal levels. Intestinal changes. Remember in hypokalemia, everything was slow. Patient could have even had a paralytic ileus. The um um, what's that word I'm looking for? What's that word? It's going to come to me, but the movement, what moves the fecal matter through the GI tract is not coming to me, but it's very, um, slow here. The motility's increased, right? In hypokalemia, we'd see constipation in hyperkalemia. We see increased motility. We see diarrhea. We see hyperactive bowel sounds. Laboratory data, obviously, the potassium is going to be higher than five. Normal potassium, 3.5 to 5. If it's hyperkalemia, it's going to be higher than five. Interventions. Drug therapy. That is our key. We're going to give the patients medications to bring that potassium back down. The priorities of nursing care for the patient with hyperkalemia are assessing for cardiac complications, because remember, that's what's going to kill the patient the fastest with hyperkalemia, those heart issues. We're going to assess them for cardiac complications. We're going to make sure they're safe because at first they have that muscle itch itching, muscle itching, muscle twitching, right? Muscle irritation. Then as it worsens, we have muscle what? Flaccidity. 
paralysis. So safety is definitely going to be an issue. And we're going to monitor the patient's response to therapy, the drugs that we're giving. Is it working? Is it doing the job? Because if not, we have to place a phone call to the physician or the healthcare provider, I should say. We're going to stop potassium containing infusions. Any infusions that have potassium, we're going to stop it. Patients are already hyperkalemic. We don't want to make it worse. We're going to keep the IV access open. We're going to withhold potassium supplements. They don't need any more potassium. And we're going to put them on a potassium restricted diet. And we're going to talk about that potassium restricted diet in a minute. Because if the patient's hyperkalemic, it's important to know what kind of foods to avoid. Stay away from those foods that are high in potassium. Where the patient's hypokalemic, those same foods that the hyperkalemic patient would avoid, we would tell them to eat those type of foods to bring up that potassium. So those type of foods are very important to know. We'll talk about that in a minute. If potassium levels are dangerously high, additional measures such as dialysis are going to be needed because we're going to have to bring down the potassium level. IV fluids containing glucose and insulin are prescribed to help decrease serum potassium level. That's very important. So um, I talked about this briefly, but I talk about this extensively in burns. If you want to know about it, go back to my video I did about burns. But as you know, when um, we giving that patient insulin, we're going to be watching the patient's potassium because giving them the insulin is going to bring down that potassium, but we want to make sure we don't overcorrect the problem and turn them into a hypokalemic patient. So that is very important to know. I put a star next to it. Don't say I didn't warn you. Uh, these IV solutions, you need to know that they're hypertonic and they're infused through a central line. Remember guys, who's the only patient that can give only patient who is the only one that can give the central lines, the registered nurse not the LPN, not the LVN. So when it comes to this, it's the RN that's going to be giving this infusion, okay? It needs to be given through a central line or in a vein with high blood flow to avoid local vein inflammation. Observe the patient for manifestations of hypokalemia because remember, us dropping that potassium, we might drop it a little bit too much and now we threw them into hypokalemia. So we're going to assess them for hypokalemia and hypoglycemia during this therapy. Why hypoglycemia, Professor D? Remember the insulin, the insulin that we're giving that's bringing down the potassium, it also brings down patient's blood sugar. What kills a patient faster, hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia? hypoglycemia. So make sure the same insulin we're giving this patient doesn't cause another set of problems that also kills our patient. This is a lot to juggle as a nursing student. It's a lot to remember. It's a lot to think about, but that's why you guys have me. This is very important though, guys, do not forget it. Cardiac monitoring. Cardiac monitoring. This patient that has hyperkalemia, that we're trying to bring that potassium down, you better bet your bottom dollar they're going to be on a telemonitor. They better be. Critical rescue. Notify the healthcare provider or rapid response team if the patient's heart rate falls below 60 beats per minute. Remember, bradycardia is one of those complications of hyperkalemia. Heart rate's supposed to be 60 to 100, so you better be calling somebody if that heart rate's lower than 60 or if the T waves become spiked, both of which accompany hyperkalemia. Make sure you know those complications. Health teaching is key to the prevention of hyperkalemia and the early detection of its complications. It's always better and easier to prevent than to treat. The teaching plan includes diet. We're going to teach them the foods high in potassium to stay away from, drugs, giving them those food, giving them foods, giving them those uh, medications to decrease the potassium, and recognition of the manifestations of hyperkalemia. Once you see those signs and symptoms, you can call the healthcare provider to get an order, get those labs drawn to confirm and um, perform those nursing interventions as appropriate. You're going to collaborate with a dietitian as far as the food and nutrition and teaching is concerned. 
Instruct the patient and family to read the labels on, dr on drug and food packages so they don't accidentally cause hyperkalemia and warn them to avoid salt substitutes. Salt substitutes are high in potassium. Now let's take a look of the foods that they need to avoid when their potassium is high. The foods the patient should avoid with hyperkalemia, meats, especially organ meats. Organ meats are high in potassium. Preserved meats, such as the bolognese, right? Dairy products, dry fruits, I put a uh, star next to it because as far as questions are concerned, that shows up a lot. So does the meats. Fruits high in potassium, bananas, that's right up on the list cantaloupe, kiwi, oranges, vegetables high in potassium, avocados, broccoli, uh, potatoes. Potatoes, that shows up a lot on NCLEX. I don't know why they like potatoes, but it does. So make sure you know it. Um, spinach. And on the other side, our list of foods that the patient can eat. You guys read that on your own. I'm not going to go over that. But make sure you know this entire list of the foods that the patient with hyperkalemia needs to stay away from that they need to avoid. Guys, that is your hyperkalemia in a nutshell. Not as hard or scary as we thought it was. So go ahead. Let me know what you thought about this video in the, in the comment section. Let me know what you'd like to see me cover. If you need help in something... you. Listen, ask your fellow viewers for help. Go ahead, plug that in the comment section. You don't never know who's willing to help you. Don't forget, I have audio lessons available on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Guys, thank you for watching this video and you guys will catch me on the next video.